Voilà, OK. OK, welcome everybody to this uh, Prairie Colloquium. Uh, so we are very glad to welcome uh, Beatrice uh, Joyeux-Prunel. So Beatrice uh, is professor at uh, the University of uh, Geneva. Uh, she holds uh, the chair in uh, Digital Humanities. And before joining uh, Geneva, she was uh, actually at Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, where she was a professor of uh, History of Art. Uh, I would not say much, but of course, she's very much involved uh, in uh, the development and research and teaching uh, at the interface of many disciplines, uh, history of art, artificial intelligence, and so on. Uh, for instance, uh, she founded a very large European program called uh, Artlas, and she's also the director of the Jean Monnet Excellence Center, uh, IMAGO. So, Beatrice, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gabriel, and thank you, Jamal, for, for your invitation. So, uh, as I said earlier, uh, I feel uh, honored to be with you, even more than I'm not uh, a computer scientist, I'm just a historian. Even though I can get by with the statistical software, GIS, of, uh, or a few lines, very few of R and Python, I am and I, I want to remain a historian rooted in the humanities. So I approach algorithms and data, data science as a user, and I tend to think and teach that they should only be useful to us, the humanists, as long as they answer specific research questions. So this is therefore through the prism of my research that I am going to explain today how data science and machine learning can be used on the issue of visual globalization, a subject I have been working on from, for some 20 years. Um, let me begin with my research question. Images have long played an essential role in globalization, be it cultural, but also economic and social. You know, all of you know that, because images uh, are, are not screen, just. Maybe? Oh, don't, I don't. I'm not sharing the screen. Sorry. She's okay, okay for now, but maybe for later it could be useful. I, I thought I was. <laughs> so this is it. Is it fine for you? So just that was my <laughs> yeah, <laughs> first yeah. screen. Okay, yeah. do you see it? Yeah. So, and I was just on that part, the second one. So, as I said, images are very important in globalization. You know that, all of you. And uh, this because images are not just images. They convey ideas. And with ideas, they convey worldviews, which induce or promote certain attitudes and spray rather than others. Images are a vector of cultural, social, political, and economic change. But however, the function of, of images is not so easy for us to understand. Images are a bit like time by St. Augustine's. If you don't think about them, you think you know what time or images are. But as soon as you are asked to define them and how they work, you feel incapable of answering. So, um, all, all of us know that uh, images are powerful, that they are effective, that they can sell, persuade, make men fantasize, <laughs> change their minds, set up, stir up envy, desire, jealousy, joy, sorrow, and so much more. And that they have played an essential role. I come back to this in globalization. Uh, if I go to research, uh, a quick state of the art. It is very paradoxical, but specialists in the history of globalization have always found it very difficult to give images as important a place as they should or as they wanted. One of the greatest specialists of, on globalization, maybe you have heard of him, Arjun Apadurai, was born in 1949 in Bombay. He's more exactly a cultural sociologist and an anthropologist who studies modernity and globalization. In his autobiographical work, Modernity at Large, he begins with these very interesting remarks. I quote, in my own early life in Bombay, the experience of modernity, which for him is also the experience of globalization, was notably synesthetic and largely pre-theoretical. I saw and smelled modernity reading Life and American College catalogs at the United States Information Service Library, seeing B-grade films and some A-grade ones from, from from Hollywood at the Rose Theater, 500 meters or yards from my apartment building. 
He continues, I begged my, mo my brother at Stanford in the early 60s to bring me black blue jeans and smelled American in his right guard when he returned. White grad is an American brand of shower gel. I gradually lost the English that I had earlier imbibed in my Victorian school books, in rumors of Rhodes scholars from my college, and in Billy Bunter. I'm not sure you know Billy Bunter. In Billy Bunter and um, and the Beagle's books devolved indiscriminately with books by Richmond Crompton and Enid Blyton. Maybe you read Enid Blyton when you were a child. I did. And then he continues, Franny and Zoo. This is Franny and Zoo. Holden Caulfield and Rabbit Armstrong slowly eroded that part of me that had been until then forever England. Such are the little defeats that explain how England lost the empire in post-colonial Bombay. I did not know that I was drifting from one sort of post-colonial subjectivity, Anglophone diction, fantasies of debates in the Oxford Union, borrowed peaks at encounter, a patrician interest in the humanities, to another, the harsher, sexier, more addictive, more addictive new world of Humphrey Bogart reruns, Harold Robbins, Time, and Social Science, American style. And so, as you see, images were very, very important in this turn from a kind of England-like globalization to an American one. And yet, Appa Durai has never sought to study the role of images in cultural modernization and globalization. Despite the, the rise of global studies, there are many, many open questions in this, uh, on this issue. How did the globalization of the 20th century, which is often presented as a Europeanization and then Americanization, how did it happen? And what was the role of images in this change? Can images be isolated as factors or as consequences of globalization or both? And how can this be articulated? What images circulated the most according to which geographical, cultural, temporal, and social channels? Can we measure the success of certain images more than others? The questions are so numerous and so many unsolved. In art history, the birth of formalism in art history aroused a fascination for the visual circulation and at the same time for the question, what makes a culture, a style, an era, but scholars have not developed clear methods to study this circulation outside of iconology, what is called iconology. They have mostly been satisfied with monographic approaches. They have studied the circulation of certain images one by one. Unfortunately, researchers erudition is not enough to understand the phenomenon of globalization. The most interesting approach, sorry, and of course, inspiring the research of the visual contagion epic that I will present you. The most interesting approach is that of Abby Warburg, a rich German art lover, intellectual and historian for pleasure. He had the means in Hamburg to acquire impressive collections of reproductions of works of art. Warburg established a comparative approach to history in which images were considered to be the bearers of collective desires, what he called Pathos formal, pathos formulas. His ambitions was to describe the dissecation of these formulas through images, through time, space, between cultures, and then to understand their circulation. For this purpose, he compared the images on large panels where he placed them, as you can see on the right or on the background of the picture and on the left. He, he, he put those, these, ima these images on large panels where he placed he, where he could look at them from a visual point of view before moving on to historical, aesthetic, and literary, con literary considerations. Warburg's somewhat crazy ambition was not really followed in art history and visual studies, except to take an interest in the irrational and apotropaic side of images. His serial, worldwide, long-term ambition was not has not been kept, perhaps because the work was too titan titanic. But I can ask the question, what would Warburg have done had he larger collections of images and had he the tools of computer vision? 
He would have been able to afford to pay computer scientists to study huge collection of images like the ones we have today. What would have he have done? Um, specialists in globalization have left the images to art historians who until recently have not been interested in images in the plural. However, of course, it is a necessity if we want to study visual globalization to work on images in the plural quantitatively. We have the sources that allow us to study uh, much larger and more exhaustive corpuses than those on which Warburg was working, enormous image banks deployed and created by institutions such as national libraries, museums, um, art history centers, I'm thinking of uh, the RKD, the Courtauld Institutes, maybe you have heard of them, the Herziana Library in Rome, the Warburg Institute, the INHR in France, etc. These enormous sources are images whose dates and often places are known to us. Computational approaches should allow us to study these images in quantity according to space and time. Among the sources available to study the worldwide circulation of images, I would like to talk first about exhibition catalogs, a source that we have used since uh, 2009 in my first project, the Atlas project, uh, which was hosted first by the École Normale Supérieure, then by Humanum, and successively financed by the ENS, the Agence Nationale pour la Recherche in France, by Europe uh, uh, with the Imago Excellence Center, and now by the University of Geneva in, uh, in Switzerland. Um, what is a, a, a catalogue? So, sorry, I have to go back to the screen. It's a, a very great source for art history. It tells you about images with texts, um, and this is, it is, in short, a kind of repository of metadata about images, which gives us for each images, for each image, sorry, its author, a title, often elements about the medium, sometimes the format, but also other information about the author, such as uh, his or her place of birth, the gender, of course. It also gives information about the image and its circulation, since the catalog gives you proof that the image was shown at such and such place at such and such a date. One even finds in the catalog information of the, on uh, uh, professional networks. Here, uh, this uh, student, this uh, artist was the student of uh, that uh, painter or that sculpture. We can find also information about dealers and the owners of the works. Here, maybe you know about the Galerie Bernheim Jean, which was the owner of many uh, modern paintings in the 19th and 20th century and which still exists in Paris, uh, uh, Rue du Faubourg Saint Honoré. Uh, we can get also many, many other things like illustrations of the works in question. Um, for the Atlas project, we were several along, uh, among uh, young researchers who had used database uh, uh, catalogs to study art history. And uh, uh, gradually, we realized that it was very interesting and more intelligent to, to, to gather and to pull our databases in a larger collaborative one to regularly increase this database to make it worldwide over the long term and thus to offer it in open access to anyone who wants to have access to great sources to study the circulation of works, the circulation of artists, the social history of art, the history of the market, the history of fashions, etc. and so and so much more. And so uh, we were able, with uh, the help of many uh, research agencies, to, to deploy an open access interface that il allows you uh, to interrogate the database according to whether you are looking uh, to, for works, exhibitors of or exhibitions, and many other uh, uh, criteria. Um, sorry, I have to uh, show you the next one. Yes. Um, Here you can see how it works. The users uh, can display uh, results in the form of a list, a zoomable map a graph. I have to, yes, go back to the video. Uh, you, uh, uh, 
the, well, the, the, the goal for us was to gently introduce art historians to a more global, quantitative, social and balanced approach to art history. Uh, uh, more women artists, more about the peripheries and not always about the centers. We also wanted and still want to break down the reluctance of several generations of art historians who have been reluctant to consider any statistical intervention in art history as a kind of bad interference of sociology in questions of beauty and genius. To, to finish on this interface, it also allows you to display here, for example, for the results of a query on works, the places when available of birth, uh, death and life of the artists, the places of conservation of the works and the places of exhibition of these works. This is a first step towards a study of the process of globalization, since we can see the geography of art changing. For instance, people often work in the same centers. Artists have worked in the same centers. But these, these centers have evolved. Uh, artists exhibit in an even smaller number of cities. They generally die in coastal places of residence in resorts. And works are collected, uh, for, in the, for example, for the years after 1945 in the industrial and financial region of Europe until the, uh, until the, the 70s and East America, from, from Milan to Amsterdam to New York. So these kind of sources and tools have been very helpful uh, for us and for my own uh, work. Uh, as a historian of artistic globalization. Uh, here I, I give you a quick advertisement for the third volume that you see on the right that will come out next week uh, of the global history of contemporary and modern art that I have been written since 20 years. Thanks to this kind of tools, quantitative approaches, etc. cetera. Uh, um, sorry. Uh, back to Atlas, we have developed an interface that invites users to go further in data science, or what we call data science. I'm not sure it's data science for you. Uh, uh, we want they, them to, to be able to think of using their own tools and their own questions about the raw data that they can retrieve as CSV. Here you can see the Yes, they can export CSVs uh, where they find the whole data that was copied from the catalog, but also uh, uh, the geographic coordinates that we added into the catalogs and that they don't have to produce themselves. They also can export images uh, from the maps and images from the, the graphs that, uh, that the interface produces. Uh, in this context, we saw quite quickly that we needed to use slightly more elaborate algorithmic techniques on our data collection side, which is also the reason why I'm talking to t uh, taking the time to talk with you, to you about Atlas. Our data recovery model has been based so far on manual copying of sources. You can think it is totally crazy. Yes, it is, but we did that. We have uh, done that. Uh, it is a rather unrewarding, time-consuming and poorly considered task in art history that you copy catalogs, put them into Excel files, and then import that into a, a, S my, a, a SQL database. Uh, in art history, if you do that, you get no recognition. Uh, I know it's uh, uh, quite similar in social science. I don't know how it is in medicine or, or other science, but if it's very understandable. In, in art history, it's much more interesting to spend 20 hours writing, writing an article about one single painting than to spend 40 hours copying a catalogue of the document at the castle that you are going to give to the world and for which very few honest researchers will quote you and for which you score zero points at the academic publication game. Altruism is really not the most widespread virtue in art history. So, um, uh, so we first we thought of very uh, a few uh, well some some kind of uh, solutions to to quote contributors and to incite uh, uh, users to quote these contributors but uh, it is not sufficient and also we wanted to gather to to spend well to spare time in, in data collection and uh, 
where we were lucky or are lucky is that exhibition catalogs constitute a semi-structured data finally enough stupidly organized for a machine to be able to recognize in our place that a title is a title and that a name is a name that a date is a date or that a, a place is a place etc this is why we have been working for several months on a machine solution to uh, our data collection currently uh, we are second, setting up a semi-automated uh, data collection process, which starts from a digital version of the catalog, uh, processes through optical character recognition, OCR, before moving to a semantic description of the content, which then allows us to transform this content into these CSV spreadsheets that you see on the right, uh, that we just have then to integrate into the Bazart uh, database. We have uh, customized um, uh, for this purpose uh, a software that you may have heard of, uh, Growbead. Uh, Growbead in French means, mean, means big belly, but the serious name is generation of bibliographic data. Uh, this software has been developed by INRIA in, in, in Paris by uh, Laurent Romary and his team. Uh, it is capable from the PDF file of an article to generate the list of all the references of this article or the list of all the places or all the names it quotes, etc. Uh, Grobid has had a few forks, notably Grobid dictionaries, which allows dictionary specialists to translate a digital version of the who's who or the petit Larousse or any other dictionary into an XML TEI version of the dictionary uh, quite easily. Grobid works with a mix of uh, natural language processing. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, Groby works with a mix of natural language processing and conditional random field. Don't ask me for precisions because I'm a, a, a total dummy about that. Uh, it's uh, basically you tell the algorithm that each line break is the beginning of a new entry, that the name of each entry is shown is bold in italics or capitals, capital letters, etc. And then the algorithm, after several hours of training on both real and artificial data, uh, it ends up uh, being able to output pretty clean in XML file uh, with you with your data and its semantic description. Um, so we have developed a, a third fork uh, from Grobit dictionaries. We have we are developing a third fork which is called Grobit Cat. Uh, uh, in partnership with INRIA for both manuscript sales catalogs and exhibition catalogs. We are therefore going to an RCR step, uh, uh, then the conversion in Alto XML file of the OCR, OCR that allows us to have an enriched PDF file with typographical elements, uh, which are essential to sorry to 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 arrive here, for example, to distinguish a bold catalog entry here, uh, 145, 146, 47, 48, set, which are in bold, uh, to distinguish these bold entries from uh, different entries with uh, with uh, figures that are not in bold, but that also uh, singularize very different uh, uh, semantic entries, like from, for instance, uh, dates or address numbers uh, written in, in regular typography. I don't know if I'm clear. I try to be clear, but uh, um, well, it's uh, well for us. It's important to get this uh, bold and italic and and uh, well typography call uh, precisions uh, to, to train the, 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 um, the software. Then, so we trained the Grobit software, the Grobit CAT model, to make it describe the semantic content of the catalogs. We have to segment the entries, and it in each entry, we designate the meaning of some parts of the entry. Here, it's an artist name. There, it's a work number. Then, it's a work title. Then, we have other information about the work. And then, uh, in the end, uh, since uh, last summer, uh, we have been able, thanks to the work of Caroline Corbière, who was a, who is a, was a student from the Ecole Nationale des Chartes, uh, an internship with a, in an, an internship at, uh, at the Imago Center, we have been able to obtain a relatively user-friendly workflow where the contributor doesn't need to do a lot of command lines to get from the input of a catalog in digital version 
uh, uh, an output, a very complete CSV file that only remains to be edited, to be parsed for some parts, but which is the parsing is, is easy and, and, and goes fast. And then we georeference the, the file addresses before integration into uh, the database. This workflow already allows us to start the integration of complete collections of enormous catalogues. For instance, the Parisian catalog du Salon des Indépendants, where you can have up to 5,000 entries per catalog each year, or other very important global collections of catalog biennial, biennial catalogues, which will be excellent sources to, to study artistic globalization since 50 years. Of course, uh, we have still uh, a lot of challenges ahead of us, uh, achieving a more accessible process for digital dummies or, or, or only for people that have no literacy in, in the digital, which is so uh, uh, frequent and so normal in art history. We want also to be able to work on low quality scans or on photographic taken on photographs taken from smartphones. Uh, this is a challenge for us, especially for catalogs in Central Europe, in Latin America, in Africa, uh, where we have partners who have access to the sources but who do not have scanners to digitize these sources. Another challenge is the more detailed semantic description of the catalogs. Ideally, Grobit should reference even cities for us. We are getting there, but maybe it will take uh, uh, some more time to, to train the model. Uh, another challenge is multilingual document management. Uh, we have many catalogues that uh, contain uh, different languages, uh, for instance, Japanese catalog which, with, uh, have, which have texts in Japanese, French and English. Uh, also non-European languages uh, is our uh, uh, challenge. We have not uh, uh, trained the, the the software on on Japanese, uh, nor on Chinese, uh, nor on Russian, uh, and and it's very important for us since we want to have global collections and not only European or North American sources. And last but not least, we want to be able to retrieve the illustrations uh, from illustrated catalogs. And here I get to my third part. Uh, uh, the vis visual contagions project, which is the hair, the hair of Atlas, but which broadens it considerably, since uh, we are studying uh, globalization through images as images, and not only through the circulation of works of art and their textual description, because as you could see with Atlas and the, the, the work on catalogs, we use only text uh, to, to, to work on this globalization. And so what do we do in, uh, in this project? Uh, we just start from images that have circulated through the illustrated print. Our main sources are sources uh, from, that contain fixed images, uh, exhibition catalogues, I've already mentioned them, but also uh, sales catalogues, uh, illustrated uh, periodicals above all are very essential or important for us. Art journals, illustrated magazines such as Time, Paris Match, Paris Match, Der Spiegel, Ola or Movie Stars, they are so numerous and globally spread uh, since 30s, 40s. Posters are also of great interest to us. Uh, one of my doctoral students is interested in film posters, another in political posters. And so what do we do? We choose our sources worldwide over a long period of time, mainly 1890, 1990, uh, without reframing from more recent objects. One of the PhD students also works on images on social networks, especially as on Instagram. We are also not forbidding ourselves to look at moving images as well, when needed, of course, uh, but not with computational approach for this time, for, for this uh, uh, part. And so uh, we use computer vision to retrieve illustrations from their printed media, to compare images with each other and to find out which patterns and which motives have circulated more than others uh, before making a statistic, aesthetic and historical analysis with or without data science. Two partners are working on the project under my, my, my leadership, as you can read here on the slide. Uh, uh, we have a European funding on the right, that of the Imago Excellence 
uh, Jean Monnet Center, uh, which is funded until 2023 at the Ecole Normale Supérieure, where, where I was until uh, 2019. Uh, the budget not being portable, it remained at the Ecole Normale Supérieure. And uh, we have uh, a much bigger funding, uh, a Swiss one, that of the Fonds National pour la uh, Recherche uh, Suisse, uh, the uh, S SNF, uh, for four years until 2025. Uh, it's just beginning uh, since uh, 10 days. I, I won't teach you anything if I tell you that we apply police techniques to images. To, we, on the one hand, they allow us to track duplicates or replicas and their circulation. Uh, on the other hand, and here uh, I show you uh, uh, another algorithm that we used, developed by the team of Mathieu Aubry. Uh, we can, uh, with this algorithm, we can bring together images according to less obvious visual proximities, uh, shared patterns, like for example here, uh, the small mill uh, uh, that uh, the computer can spot, but that the human eyes uh, cannot notice so 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 easily. Uh, in the projects, uh, we decided to work on three main axes. It's always important to have uh, uh, axes. Uh, uh, the uh, globalization of style, we want to explain the circulation of style to see uh, how they circulated it, to explain how they are circulated. Uh, uh, the reason can be social, can be cognitive, can be uh, aesthetic, can be historical, they can be uh, um, economic, uh, etc. So for us, it's important to, 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 to see that and to, to better explain uh, this circulation that scholars have never explained. Usually they say it's an inference, like something like a kind of a, a, a big power of, of such image, but I think we can understand that kind of, a, we can understand that scientifically or try to do that scientifically. Uh, uh, the third axe uh, is uh, the circulation of uh, images of the image of women, uh, uh, trying to see if there has been a kind of homogenization of uh, the way uh, uh, people uh, present, uh, put images in in in, in put uh, women in images, uh, and the uh, third axis is uh, uh, the global circulation of. Uh, uh, the visual semantics of resistance in politics. Here, here I just put a, a Google image search, uh, but uh, uh, we are almost sure that some patterns, that some political images have circulated from the Russian Revolution 1917 uh, to other parts of the world, including right-wing movements that uh, recuperated uh, uh, these kinds of, uh, uh, of semantics for their own propaganda uh, goals. But still, we have to, to verify and to demonstrate this uh, hypothesis. Um, uh, while our infrastructure is uh, under construction, uh, I will speak about this later, uh, we are working on a first uh, uh, case study uh, on the image of women, uh, thanks to a databank, database of images entrusted to us by independent scholar Knaif Bender, who has been collecting since the years 2000 all the images representing Venus that he finds throughout the world. Uh, and I can say you, it's an impressive database. Uh, he has uh, uh, more, uh, almost uh, four. 40,000 images representing Venus with uh, metadata uh, describing these images about date, uh, name of the author, uh, place of creation, etc. Uh, this first case study is uh, very interesting for us since it, uh, uh, it allows us to test our methods to try uh, some algorithms and other ones to better choose and parameterize these algorithms and to test also our infrastructure and the way we work. Uh, thanks to Mathieu Aubry, in the spring of 2018, uh, we were able to uh, very quickly highlight the presence in this corpus of certain models more than others. Here I, I show you uh, uh, some of the results of uh, of this uh, of the algorithm uh, uh, applied on the database, uh, which uh, enabled us to see eight clusters. 
uh, very important ones, uh, uh, starting with uh, uh, specific images that some of you may know or recognize. For instance, you are recognizing here the Milo, Milo Venus. I don't know how you pronounce that in English. We say in French, the Venus de Milo. Uh, maybe you saw also uh, the uh, Urbino Venus uh, uh, from the Renaissance time, uh, etc. Here, this one is the Naissance de Venus by Cabanel. Here, you can see the Spring by Botticelli, etc. Uh, very interesting. So, uh, just I stopped the, the video. Uh, very interestingly, uh, 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 these uh, uh, clusters and this the history, the chronology, and the circulation of these clusters are is very interesting. Very interesting for us because. Uh, it shows that uh, the theme of Venus is not at all a specificity of antiquity. Uh, uh, also, that uh, uh, it appears in particular in avant-garde circles during the most intense periods of crisis and reflection on what art is, what innovation means, what time is, the future and the present of art. And I find very interesting that the woman interferes in these questions uh, in very male uh, milieu networks of artists uh, in competition to, uh, uh, who needed to paint women and to paint the, 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 the theme of Venus to renovate art and their practices. And I think there is something to do about that to better understand how uh, art innovation creation has worked between desires, between competition, uh, between gender questions, etc. And not only with the idea of uh, uh, past and present uh, in, 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 in opposition. Um, uh, another interesting reason, for instance, in, is that uh, uh, we can establish that uh, ancient and Renaissance iconography was very present in artistic circles until the 1990s. Uh, on the other hand, we, we can see that the images of artistry inspire very little in uh, the film, uh, uh, film poster, film poster product producers. Uh, you can find many, many uh, images with Venus traditional images uh, with Venus in uh, art history called circles in art in painting circles but not at all in uh, in this kind of uh, culture that we could say popular culture of movie uh, uh, perhaps uh, here we have uh, something it has something to do with another idea of what a woman's body is worth I don't know uh, our Venusian corpus, when it is enlarged, should also allow us to formulate hypotheses on the image of women and their evolution through the centuries and the ages. This corpus also serves us from a methodological point of view uh, as a proof of concept of how we can visualize the circulation of certain images in space and time. What I'm showing we, here is only a series of badly fagged images that I made myself with uh, my PowerPoint. But we are thinking about a mode of animated spatial temporal representation of the circulation of patterns of images where we could visualize by thumbnails on maps the way in which certain images and patterns have circulated more than others, the channels of the circulation or non-circulation of these uh, images, as well as the chronology and the speed of this circulation. Working on speed is very interesting if you want to understand globalization. And as far as uh, have I as as well, I think I have, I, well, uh, uh, for the time being, I've never read anything about the speed of circulation of cultural items. And I think that we can do something about that with the, the sources we have and with the help of computational um, analysis. Um, it is uh, there, and uh, it will be my last point. I'll go back to the slide. Yes, yes. Uh, that uh, uh, the project workflow and its infrastructure are essential. Um, what do we want to do? Uh, very uh, 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 quickly, we want first to retrieve images, not only from our projects, like the Venus one, so we have a scholar who gathered images, but also we want much more images, we want a global source. And so for us, it's uh, not, uh, the point is, how can we retrieve images from other projects and use them, reuse them? We also want to infer apparent from 
uh, uh, other images. I will explain that uh, uh, um, uh, better later. I want to be uh, uh, to to know that if that image is a copy of the first one, and if a third one is the copy of the first one, we want to be able to automatically infer that the second and the third images are uh, similar. I also want to save time. The time we spent gathering image pairs algorithmically, which is another issue uh, that I will uh, explain you uh, about. Um, so first point, what do we do to retrieve images from other projects? We use uh, a, a specific technical solution. Uh, we choose interoperable formats for the management of images and their metadata. I don't know if you know uh, IIIF. Uh, it's a format that maybe you're not familiar with, but it's great for lightening our algorithm implementation and not only uh, for uh, 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 interoperability and exchange of images between uh, many, many projects. IIIF stands for International Image Interoperability Framework. Uh, this acronym refers to a community of digital libraries. They wanted and they still want to solve the issue of the silos in which their own data was or are separated. They want to make sure that they can share their data. IIIF also refers to the standard they have developed together, the one by which these libraries can share and distribute their images in a freely accessible way. Um, many images are available now in IIIF format. Uh, I, I give you here a, a quick list of uh, very important <clears throat> digital libraries. Uh, the list is growing uh, regularly, uh, but for the uh, Visual Contagion project, we are using images from the Gallica Bibliothèque Nationale de France Digital Library, from the Cambridge Digital Library, from the uh, University of uh, Heidelberg in Germany's uh, in the, its library, etc. Uh, with IIIF, what can we do? Uh, what can, pardon, no, this is not what I want. Yes, I just want the slides. Yes, sorry. What can you do? So here I give you an example from uh, the uh, virtual manuscript uh, library of Switzerland. Uh, with uh, IIIF, you, you can first find images, uh, uh, browse uh, into uh, image uh, databases, but also uh, uh, you can do much more uh, you can uh, uh, find images, you can uh, provide high resolution consultation of documents. I go back to the, yes, here. Here, for instance, I give, I give you an, uh, an example uh, on uh, old uh, music manuscripts. So I, I just made a request. I wanted, as I told the, 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 the interface, I want such and such manuscript, and then I can uh, uh, find the pages I want very quickly. I don't have to upload the, the, the to download the files. Uh, I can find very high resolution of these uh, images. You can see I, I zoom on in, uh, I zoom in uh, and zoom out. Uh, you can also compare documents from different institutions and locations. Even if uh, you have one interface, you can uh, see several documents from different uh, institutions and, and servers. You can quote and share images. You can combine, reconstitute, mix piece, pieces of images. You can also uh, annotate images. Uh, here, uh, another example from the Mirador viewer of the Harvard Art Museum server, IIIF server. Uh, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, they, they annotated automatically some of their artworks. Here, for instance, they, 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 their algorithm uh, decided that this statue could be a mile 67 percent and seems to be happy, confused, etc. So that was generated automatically. But also, I can annotate myself some parts of these images and I can save uh, this annotation, which is just great for projects such as uh, the Visual Contagion project because not only you can annotate but also you can share the annotations that you that you made not only on your own images but also on the images to come in from other projects that so the images that you did not have to create not to to, to digitize not to describe etc um 
Um, with IIIF, you can also build authentic, authentication procedures in order to work on images that you would not be allowed to, to put online publicly. For us, this is also essential because we work on often on very recent data. For example, for the Venus database I was talking about, only 40% of the entries will be accessible to the general public eventually because the artist died after uh, less than 70 years ago or because we just don't know the dates of death of the authors of the, the images. And finally, with the IIIF, you can use a learning machine without having to bother managing the names of your images and their metadata at the same time and keeping the same identifier for very small parts of the images. Uh, I, I explained that much uh, with more details. A IIIF works essentially thanks to three elements. First, a visualization tool, it's a bit the front end, uh, a software like Mirador or Universal Viewer, which use online allows anyone to view any images served on any IIIF server. I said that earlier. The most frequent viewers allow you to view an image, to display its metadata, to transcript it, to comment it, etc. But for our project, we want to be imaginative. We want to propose visualizations such as chronological lists of nearby images, maps that will allow us to quantify and locate certain images or patterns that have been circulating a lot, etc. A second essential ingredient in the IIIF recipe are uh, two APIs. Uh, an image API, which describes how the program must communicate with the server to obtain an image, and a presentation API, which says how a machine should present an image and its metadata. What is important for us here is that each image is encoded according to uniform resource identifiers uh, um, that are highly codified, where we can successfully read information about the identifier of an image. I don't know if you can see my, my mouse. Uh, you can see the identifier, pardon, here of the image here. So this is the the, the year URI of uh, a specific image that I found on the, the, the Bodleian library at Oxford. So here I have the, the, the name of the server, the file where images are stored, then uh, the specific identif identifier of the image itself, and then uh, specifications about the way I want to 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 see uh, uh, the image on my screen. Uh, here I want the full region. Here I want the uh, full size of the image. No rotation. Uh, default quality. So this is the quality uh, of the the original original digital file. And then here the format. Uh, uh, he, if I go to the next one, uh, the next slide, you can see that I can change the criteria of uh, uh, the, the image presentation. For instance, here I put square and not uh, a full, so I have a square part of the image. Here I put a specific part. I decided that I wanted to, to see a specific part of uh, the image, so I can I get this part of the of the square of the image here i said okay uh, put my put my image uh, upside down which is done and here uh, you can have get the image in gray there are other specifications that you can find on triple uh, uh tutorials uh, um, and third uh, ingredient of the recipe, last one, uh, it's uh, uh, the manifest, what they, what we call uh, the manifest. Uh, uh, to each image, uh, there is uh, what is called the manifest. The, uh, uh, the one manifest has been taken from merchant shipping vocabularies. Uh, a manifest is the list of all the goods that are in the boat and that, that have to make a specific trip with this boat, even if the boat then goes on to another harbor what, where it will, it will deliver other goods. And with IIIF, the manifest of an image is a JavaScript file that contains all the metadata that, that describe uh, the image. Uh, uh, it's a very light file that makes it possible to manage not only the metadata but also uh, a kind of nesting between images. For example, that the sheet, that the page on the left is in fact folio number 35 of a complete manuscript. And so the URI of, URI of the manifesto is written 
uh, from the URI of the parts of the image that you want to view. Each image part is inherits the metadata of the complete image and the metadata of the image group uh, to which it belongs. I'm not know. I don't know if it's very clear, but here you can see that. Uh, so this the same image I, I saw. I showed you uh, earlier uh, uh, has these. Uh, this is just part of the metadata uh, associated to it. Uh, some, for instance, that it's an image that it's uh, um, published by such and such library with such and such uh, uh, rights conditions. Uh, that it is uh, number uh, eight of uh, a specific uh, bigger book, etc. Um, uh, the the so interoperability. So uh, yes, this is go to going yes to finish with uh, uh, this manifest. So here you have the the link I used earlier to to show you how uh, uh, an image can be. Um, uh, uh, displayed uh, with different uh, sizes and 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 definitions etc and so as you see uh, the URI of the manifest is very similar uh, to uh, the URI of the image uh, um, interoperability is also important for the image description side we want to be able to retrieve as much of the data already digitized by other projects as possible. And similarly, we want to allow other projects interested in our data to retrieve ours. So we have chosen for our metadata the CDOC CRM ontology to describe them. Uh, it's an ontology developed in the museum world. Everyone calls an author the same way, a work the same way, so uh, we can uh, uh, do automatic harvesting of data from other projects. Um, the advantage of uh, CDOC CRM is that it is a, a, a RDF compliant. Uh, uh, I come to my uh, second point for this infrastructure. Uh, we need to describe our data in such a way that it can inherit properties from each other, that we can make inferences from certain links between certain images to infer other links between objects that a rational database would not allow to be linked. Uh, if I, I take an example, uh, uh, here, uh, 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 an image A is a copy of an image B, if an image A is a copy of an image B, and image C is a copy of image B, it is logical to conclude that image C is also a copy of image A. Uh, with a relational database, you cannot infer this conclusion. Uh, with RDF, you can do that. So this is the quick, uh, quickly the data model that we have developed uh, with a, a, a quick, quick zoom uh, uh, on um, to show you uh, the relationships that can be made. Uh, for example, an object E24 is represented by an image. Uh, this image contains a visual item that we decide to say is an interesting pattern to study. For example, uh, we want to track the circulation of the hands of the Statue of Liberty, etc. Uh, the advantage of an RDF infrastructure uh, store, uh, is that the data can be very easily interoperable, especially if we deploy ontologies shared by others. And also, it is very easy to install, as we have done, uh, a Spark UL endpoint, uh, an interface where the users can quite easily query the database and generate quantitative results very quickly without needing to master RDF or databases or for us to develop a query and visualization interface right away. One day is enough to learn how to write a SparkQL query to obtain very quickly results on quite powerful queries. You can practice with weak data if you want. It's the best way to understand how it works and it's really powerful. And as we want to, to get results very uh, uh, soon, we don't want to, to have to wait for the, the development of an infrastructure of a, a, an interface before getting results for research. Um, I'm uh, almost concluding. 
concretely, uh, we are now at the stage where we integrate in our RDF database the data we have collected in spreadsheets. After having augmented this data precisely with the harvesting of other triple stores, for instance, we, we take geonames, uh, to associate geographic coordinates to our place names. Uh, we use also ULAN uh, to associate birth and death years and birth and death places to our artists' names. Uh, last point, not the simplest, we are preparing the interface uh, uh, that will allow us to make matches between our images. We start from scans of illustrated prints. We describe them in tables, as you can see. Uh, these tables allow us to generate for each image a manifesto, and then we associate image and manifesto to serve the images in IIIF formats. The images can be retrieved by queries, according to their common elements, provided the common elements are tagged, of course, and eventually we will be able to visualize them in order to find circulations after having enriched uh, as much as possible as what we know about these images. But the strategic point is the way we will describe our images and in particular, we want to be able to identify images that look alike and allow us to say that something visual has circulated and we want to study how it has circulated. We do this uh, uh, in several stages. Uh, first, a sem segmentation stage. Uh, um, um, we detect in our printed matter the illustration then content to keep only uh, the illustrations. This step is advanced. Robin Champenois, PhD student with me and Mathieu Aubry helps us in this task and we will soon test uh, a, a small segmentation interface. Uh, here I can show you some uh, tests. It's not, well, yes, here. Um, and then uh, we compare uh, uh, the patterns um, we compare the images with each other to find first duplicates on the left and then to find common patterns. Finding replicas is quite simple, but finding common patterns takes a lot of computing time. And so we need to think about how we are going to label the patterns and to tell the machine and the user that an image contains such and such a pattern so that we don't need to start over each time the pattern analysis and image comparison. Uh, it's uh, one step forward for us uh, uh, is, a, to, is to share these patterns, these pattern labels with other projects that also do like us, pattern analysis and image comparison. I'm thinking, for example, for example, of the NumaPress project. They they have a big uh, uh, um, a big um, database of journals which they they from which they take uh, illustrations and they detect similar illustrations and so the work they do is the work is a work that we don't we don't want to do too and we want to exchange things with that so there is a real a, ch a real challenge here as much for the digital humanities applied to images as for compute computer vision to invent a way of uh, common etiquetage, the common classification of, of patterns, be it semantic or not at all. Maybe we could say that, okay, uh, the number three, four, one third, uh, one, one six would be the, uh, I don't know, uh, the code for selling, for, to, to say that that image has the, the, the hand of the Statue of Liberty in it. I don't know, but that's something we, we have to think about and, and for that we have to, to meet and, and, and to work a, a, a lot. Um, I end now with this list of uh, where we are. It's always uh, uh, good for uh, projects uh, organizers to be uh, eyes to, to see uh, what they do and what is done and what is still to be done. I'm sorry, what I presented you is only a sum of small tasks which we are patiently carrying out uh, one after the other. Uh, uh, Behind that is a big dream, no real results yet, no sexy interface, uh, but maybe next year I'll be able to show you more. Uh, so I thank you for your attention and I'm also uh, uh, very glad if you have questions, discussions and ideas, especially for the last challenge I, I talked to you about. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Beatrice, for this amazing talk. It was a lot of information. Um, if there are questions, you can post uh, in the chat or you can just unmute your mic. And, um, I mean, I have a lot of questions. Maybe I can start with maybe a simple question, or maybe it's not so simple. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm one, so here you insisted a lot on the tools and presented mm. a catalog of tools. I'm wondering whether, in some case, you you actually find at the end some kind of conclusion. Um, I don't know that contradict maybe some common conception in the history of art, or maybe on yes. contrary, like yes, of course, and that is hard to, to admit yes. for other more traditional yes. scholars. Um, uh, since uh, so, I, as I I, um, I don't know if you remember this slide where I show you the books I have published. Uh, I, in these books, I contradict many uh, given ideas, maybe uh, 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 um, pensives or, or or short ideas that uh, that you can read in art history. For instance, that everything happened in Paris uh, before 1945, and that everything happened in New York since 1945. This is one of the main uh, uh, things I'm I'm kind of struggling about against many colleagues that uh, usually say that modernity was invented in Paris, and then avant-gardism has been developed in uh, in uh, in New York since uh, 19. 1945. What I can see with not with uh, computer vision. I didn't need computer vision for that. I just used uh, these catalogs and statistics and cartography. But what I can say is that uh, 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 um, modernity, uh, modern artists uh, created not only in these centers and very often that it started in the peripheries and it had to to circulate to be recognized then in the centers. So this is one of the things I, I think I, I demonstrated. Very interesting other one is, for instance, the idea that, uh, uh, you know, there has been many publications about uh, American uh, hegemony, cultural hegemony in art since uh, 1945. Uh, many, uh, so first schools said that uh, American art was just the best because there was the best, that it was a kind of essential it's essentialist interpretation. And then in the 70s and 80s, there was a revisionist interpretation that said, uh, no, the American won the cultural uh, uh, domination because the CIA helped and sent uh, artworks all over the world. But if you check that with maps, uh, with statistics, with uh, data, you realize that uh, first they, they did not send art, they sent photography, they sent movies, they sent um, uh, um, design, uh, uh, f uh, fridges <laughs> and automobiles, but not art until the end of the 60s, uh, at the end of the 50s. And that's so this kind of idea that uh, uh, American art was uh, uh, central to uh, every to 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 artistic uh, circles uh, in the 40s and the 50s it is just false, uh, and so that's some well that for instance an idea that uh, that can be demonstrated with these uh, methodologies uh, for uh, computer vision uh, for the moment we have not many, many results. I talked to you about what we can say about Venus. Uh, for the moment, we are in the starting part of gathering collections, uh, trying to, to, to have representative uh, data, uh, which is an issue because uh, it's very easy to, to, to have European, European uh, periodicals digitized, much easier to have uh, uh, North American uh, uh, sources, but when it gets to finding sources from India, uh, from Africa, where prints circulated, where prints were produced, it's much, uh, much more difficult. And so here, infrastructure is an issue because for us to get these, uh, uh, these, uh, uh, these images, these scans, we need uh, collaborators. We have them. They are very much enthusiastic about uh, giving data to this uh, study of globalization and helping change the idea of centers and peripheries. But what they don't have is uh, the means to digitize, etc. And so we have to provide that for them. And this is why infrastructure is so is so strategic. Okay. Thanks, yeah. thanks a lot. Very detailed answer. It's very nice. Um, other question? I mean, 
I can go on with questions for hours, but maybe I will not. Okay, I guess people are shy. Maybe very exotic for you. Not that, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, this was very sharp and very precise on the tools, at least. So I guess most of us uh, could understand this part. And uh, I think you made a very good job uh, at this. M maybe regarding this, maybe I have another question. Uh, because um, most of the people, I mean, many people are machine learners. And, and you spoke briefly about like training or learning at some points, but you didn't mm -hmm. insist on it. No. Uh, what, what, what could you say about I this? Um, I don't do it myself. <laughs> well, uh one of the there are many many issues about that uh we for for, for the for, for the catalog part that i uh presented uh, uh one issue is to be sure that the algorithms we use to to fair for OCR are good that our OCR is uh uh, uh, doesn't give too many typos, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. that we are able to be sure that uh, it did not confuse a list with a table, another issue for us. For instance, if you have a list with uh, numbers and then titles, sometimes the OCR algorithm, the OCR software thinks that it's a table, and for us it's not a table, it's a list. So, And also that the OCR gets a typography that uh, such word is uh, written in bold that that one is in italics because for us uh, typography is a, a, a clue is a is an indication uh, of 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 semantics of sense that if it's bold it means for instance that it's the name of an artist you see how important it is for us so we have to train uh, uh, our tools uh, OCR tool and then the Grobit uh, uh, software to be sure that the, uh, the that every step has the minimum uh, errors possible because if you have 80% good results for the first step and 80% good results for the second step uh, it doesn't mean that the third step will be good because you have to multiply uh, errors uh, rates and so uh, here this is why we have to to train uh, our um, our models, uh, of course, it's uh, an evidence for you. Uh, um, I but also maybe for, like you, you mentioned the work of Mathieu Aubry and people like this, which, which I yes. guess it's even more problematic. But then, because I mean, I guess it would be trained on things that are nothing to do with art. I mean, I don't yes. know actually, but I guess he trained yes. this on standard data sets. So I guess Wait. for OCR, uh, you can uh, pretty much control the things. But maybe if you train a deep yeah. network, uh, well, it's for the for the moment, the, what we have done is very uh, small. We have just uh, tested the, uh, uh, the, um, the algorithm on the, the, the Venus uh, corpus. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yes, I, I think that uh, there will be a, a real issue when it, it comes to to using more bigger bigger corpora. Uh, honestly, I'm not able at this point to 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 say and to know what will happen because uh, I have worked much on the earlier steps and uh, I just know that uh, the algorithm is very interesting for for what we need and that uh, well to get replicas I I I think I can say that it, replicas would not be an issue uh, getting replicas will be very easy because uh, whatever the 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 corpus you train the algorithm with um, you get replicas and it's fine uh, but for patterns it will be maybe more of an issue at mm. well maybe not so much because um the the issue of training is maybe more a question when it's uh, about uh, uh, describing content like uh, gender uh when it's well i don't know describing here it's just describing that a pattern is a pattern and is shared by two images. I don't know if technically uh, you need to to train specific corp to train your algorithm on, on very specific corpora because a pattern is just a pattern. I guess we, for we, small pattern or, or not so complex uh, um, how do you call this like a high level uh, high level classification maybe maybe you're right. Yes. But because you know, we, we, we are not specifically interested in saying this is that style or this is that style. I think for a project that would want to mm. to to decide uh, what are the styles of what images, 
they should use uh, uh, maybe first a corpus of artistic uh, works, and there are there there are some corpuses uh, of artistic work that have been used to train uh, algorithm uh, for for styles for style recognition. But maybe I don't know. That's an open question. Uh, I, maybe I can. But it's good that you that you ask uh, this question because I, because I will think of it uh, when when time comes. <laughs> Okay, so okay, if there's no question, I, I think I, I could uh, just add something. I have a question. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, um, thank you very much for your talk. My name is Betis Kovilich and yeah. I work at the Aramis Lab in Paris. Um, there is a growing question in machine learning at the moment of uh, representativity of the data sets that are used for trainings and um, bias, if you want. So mm -hmm. the, the idea being that there may be some bias in the data and then when you train algorithms, they may replicate this data. So I was mm. wondering if you if you are integrating these thoughts in your data collection, and for example, trying to represent um, art schools that were not necessarily in fashion or not necessarily the the the, the main or major one at the time. Or I mean, you mentioned mm. um, international art and uh, mm. not not necessarily restricting yourself to. Well, the question is. Your question is very close to what Gabriel uh, uh, asked. Um, as I said, we, well, for our, the project, the idea is not to gather images according to their style. We don't want to say this image is impressionist or this image is cubist. I don't need that. Uh, I don't need uh, computers to do that. I see that myself, and I'm intelligent, and uh, I go much quicker than the than the algorithm. What we want is to find. Uh, first replicas so here to find replica the data set for training doesn't need to be so representative otherwise I, I have not understood how it works but a replica is just the fact that two images are the same for that I'm not sure there is a question of bias do you think so um, this... not necessarily but I mean beyond styles uh, one can think also about history let's um, if we take the example of Aboriginal art in Australia, um, yes. some of it has been destroyed uh, during the um, yes. during well the colonization, and yes. um, so there could be an inherent bias of um, what, what what is actually available. Yes, well, where it, the bias could be or is for us is in the way we gather our our, our corpus. Uh, of study. As I said, we need global corpora, so it's very important that we find uh, uh, journals because we work on printed materials. So we take what is printed, what was printed at the time, and it's very important for us that we are sure that we find uh, printed material for every part of the world for the whole period. Uh, for I mean, uh, for instance, uh, for the years 1950s, if we have only European uh, sources, we cannot say that we work on globalization. Uh, if we have African prints, African journals, Latin American uh, magazines, uh, uh, Asian magazines, this is where we will be able to say, okay, we have a corpus that is global. Uh, after that, um, what we will do is first to find uh, if such or such images have been reproduced more than other, others, and here we just work on replicas. And training uh, the training dataset is not an issue, I think. And for the second part of the of the, the research, we will search for uh, small parts of images that are replicated. And here too, it's a not. I, I'm, I'm. I don't think uh, that uh, that they could be. A bias in the training of data sets because just we are looking for patterns, just visual patterns. A visual pattern is a pattern. We are not looking for uh, for qualitative information in the images. We decide. I I have decided that the qualitative information that we pronounce or that we formulate is our uh, uh, formulation. It's not. Uh, it it will not be given or uh, um, uh, uh, translate transferred to the machine yeah thank that's you very much yeah, yes that, that that doesn't answer my question mm. 
Okay, once again, very clear answer. So I guess we, if there is no more question, uh, we should thank Beatrice. Um, at least I will thank Beatrice for this very nice talk. Also, I could advertise for another talk that Beatrice gave maybe two years ago at ONS on a totally different topics with a uh, with an artist actually. So if you are interested in generative networks and generative art and also of course the uh, story of art, uh, you, I mean you can find it on, on YouTube, for instance. And this is like almost the opposite of today's talk. So it's quite quite interesting. So thank you, Beatrice. Uh, see Jamal is here also. Um, and well, see you everyone next month on the on the 10th of, of February for the next uh, colloquium that would be announced, uh, I guess, uh, very soon. See you everyone, and I will stop the recording.